Hey guys, I'm really excited about today. Uh, I've got uh, got a, uh, another guest today, and this guest is somebody that I've been a Patreon to uh, for for quite a while, and just really love his work. I, I use his work in in what I do. I, I use it in my games, and um, and you might recognize the style of this map because it's one of his. Um, but I've got I've got Tom Cartos on. Hey Tom. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. What we're going to do today, gang, is we're just going to, we're going to talk about some of Tom's work, but we're going to do it in the context of, of Foundry. And we're actually going to build some things and, and we're going to leverage this considerable library uh, and body of work that, that Tom has made to uh, just show you as, as GMs who maybe are new to Foundry or, or maybe you've been in it for a while and you don't, you know, you don't know how to make things work. Um, and, and maybe you want to see some of these like new modules that can kind of enable and sort of um, augment uh, some of the stuff that even Tom does. So we're going to go through that today. And I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm walking through this scene and we're going to go through this in detail later. Um, but I'm going to show you, I've added some things to this scene. Like I just clicked on a glowing sword that happens to be one of Tom's and I received a sword. And that sword is now in my inventory, and it's the Frost brand. And this is something that uh, comes with one of Tom's uh, modules. And so, yeah, today's going to be about talking to Tom about his process and his method. And we're going to um, actually build some stuff live. And I'm going to walk you through uh, some things with, uh, with his maps that I've created that uh, might be interesting to you guys. Um, but yeah, that's, that's really the goal today. So you ready, Tom? Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited to learn along with everyone else. All right. And hey, if you see something that I'm doing that doesn't make sense, or I, I took for granted uh, that I was doing it, stop me uh, by all means. <laughs> well, let's talk about it because people want to hear that as well. It's I'm so I'm so you know elbow deep in the technology that uh, sometimes I'll take things for granted. So um, just to kind of kick us off, I'm, I'm going to use a bunch of different modules today, and I'm gonna I'm gonna link those in the in the video. So if people see me doing stuff and they want to know like what these things are, I will I will make sure that you guys have links to these as well, so you can go investigate them yourself. Um, but uh, but yeah, that's that's our goal. So let's let's start. I'm going to start building a scene, and then I'm going to ask you some questions while I'm doing it. Um, Absolutely. To start the scene, though, I'm going to actually use a module. And uh, as you guys may know, uh, the Molinet module is one of my favorite modules. Once you install it, you in all of its pieces, you get all this stuff here. And and Tom's um, a, a good portion of your work is is in Molinet, right? Yeah, it is. Uh, all of my assets are in there, all the tokens and all of my foundry ready scenes. We don't have all the maps in there yet because we are still going through the back catalog and converting them for foundry, but they will all be in there at some point. I mean, you only have about a thousand maps in there, so. Um... Oh, is that it? Oh, we're definitely, that, definitely sure. Yeah. don't have enough in there. It's crazy. Um, so you have a, a series that I really like called Into the Wild. And yeah. what it is, and, you're, and you guys are seeing some of these maps here, it's, it's maps that are, are relatively simple and they're super flexible and they're, they're built to work with the rest of your assets. And this is, I think, one of the most important things for GMs is, is the, the unexpected, right? Yeah, when your your party takes a detour you weren't expecting, or you know that you've got like random encounters to build, and so you need things like clearings and fields and forests, sort of like ready to go. But but then the ability to to slightly tweak them or customize them is is super powerful. So you guys are just seeing some of the some of these types of assets here, and I, I just wanted to pick one, and and we'll just kind of build off of it. So again, I'm using Molinet. I found this scene with a cave and I'm going to import it. And Molinet's going to uh, pull it down and it's going to include any you know, walls or lights or anything like that that might come with the scene. And it'll put it into here, into Molinet. So I've got this bear's cave all of a sudden in my world, right? And so we're going to start with this and we're going to see, you can see there's like 
walls and trees already set up. So this is a great little start for me. But but what I want to do is I want to build maybe like an encampment here above. Maybe there's somebody sort of guarding this uh, this this cave, right? So that's that's my objective as a GM is I'm gonna I'm gonna build that thing. So uh, I'll, I'll show you the mechanics quickly that I'm gonna go through, and then I want to talk to you, Tom, about you know how you think about about these things and and sure. maybe even back up and get some of your story. But I'm going to open up Molinet and uh, I'm going to open up this tile browser. And I'm going to look, I'm going to go to your stuff here. And there's a way in the Molinet settings to, to be able to filter by, by creator, right? So Tom's got so much stuff in here. It's <laughs> mind boggling. Almost, man. <laughs> yeah, it's absurd. We're getting up there. I know. And, and really, like every class of thing that I would want from furniture to item to, to other stuff, I mean, we've got tokens in here. I look up just the word CR, um, all of a sudden I get all of these, you know, tokens and I can drop them in using a Molinet. So that's just tokens and there's tons and tons of those. But what I'm going to look for is a couple of items. Uh, like you've got these like convenient little hills here. And yeah, this is a new addition to the set. Yeah. And, and so let's see, I've got it set to 400. Let's see what that looks like when I drag it in. 400 dpi for those of you who don't know okay so maybe it's a little bit bigger than i want and i actually have a, a module called quick set scale where i can just hit my bracket key and i can just make this thing like exactly the size that i want and uh maybe i want to drag another one in and you know to be able to make elevations on the fly and and make a tactically interesting map is a really big deal right um, and I don't know how many people have ever like wanted to have the ability to do this, but you know, with Molinet and with all Tom's stuff in here, like I don't even have all of this stuff installed as a module. I just have it in Molinet and it's pulling it off the cloud and it's just downloading what I'm using. And so it's super efficient and they're all like these nice little WebP files that, that hardly take up any space at all. And all of a sudden I've already got, you know, kind of an interesting, um, sort of camp started. So I'm going to add some more stuff. But while I'm doing that, I want to ask you, Tom, like what, how, how did you get started in this? Um, I mean, were you, did, was this like the job you wanted when you were, uh, when you were a kid or I get what, how, how'd you find your way here? Uh, it was uh, almost an accident, uh, to be perfectly honest. So I, when I was a teenager, I used to play tabletop war games. I had never played a whole lot of tabletop role play games, but things like Warhammer and Warhammer Fantasy I played a lot of. So when I was younger, I definitely had in my mind that it would be really cool to work in that industry. But, you know, I kind of um, got a bit older, moved away from the hobby for a little while. I went off to university and I studied architecture and I worked as an architect for about five years uh, in a couple of places around the world. I worked in London, I worked in Singapore, um, mm -hmm. but I started to get a little tired of the job and wanted to have something that was a bit more of a creative outlet for myself. So I started learning to draw in my spare time. And while learning to draw, I was looking for podcasts to listen to and came across something called Critical Role, which is um, effectively how I got kind of back into the tabletop hobby. Yeah, I think like a lot of people who are coming into it new. Um, I decided along with my partner to leave Singapore where I was working at the time. And we moved to Costa Rica to have a to try something new uh, but it's a little bit hard to get work as a foreigner in Costa Rica so I couldn't work as an architect there so I started taking commissions online for architectural illustrations and someone contacted me uh, having seen my illustrations and said could you do something like that but for my Dungeons and Dragons game. Wow. So initially uh, yeah I kind of just um, switched from doing architectural plans to doing fantasy plans in a slightly more illustrative style. And after doing that for a couple of months, I decided that I was really enjoying it. Um, it seemed like a lot of people were looking for this kind of thing. So that's um, that's kind of how I fell into it. It was just a, a bunch of coincidences that all kind of came together at once. That's interesting, so yeah. I, 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 your, your architectural um, background, I think really comes through in, uh, in the stuff that you do. It, yeah. it's it's rational like you make things that are <laughs> you know like you could imagine in real life and they in this sort of work and i think a lot of you know sort of up-and-coming mappers don't 
don't haven't really uh, sort of mastered that yet. Um, and, and sure. you know, probably because you know they don't have that type of background. And uh, anyway, that's yeah, it's, that's definitely a thing. Um, yeah, it's definitely how I approach my my map making design. And people who know my work will know that a lot of my catalog is buildings and interiors. So you're looking at the Into the Wild series, and I do plenty of these wilderness maps as well. But my focus is the the man made the built stuff. Yeah, and we'll. Uh... Uh, we'll we'll be uh, zooming into a couple of those here today as well, um, and so you know here here we've just like made a scene like while we've been talking right back to yep I'll, I'll give somebody some eye candy nicely. they're gonna go what is he doing I'm opening up uh, something called uh, config presets and and I can like automatically draw fires and candles and other things that I set up and um, you know I put a little uh, roof over this. Um, you know, over this wagon, for example, if I drag my player in here, you know, there's the roof and they can go inside the wagon. And, and of course I could spend some time, you know, really dialing this in, but you know, this is, this is just a bunch of pieces, right? A bunch of Tom's artwork um, thrown together. And uh, you know, I guess while I'm at it, because I really want this to be tactically interesting, I'm going to find a ladder of yours and uh, I kind of like this one. And I'm going to put a drop shadow on it. I don't know if you know that this is possible, but using Molinet, you can put drop shadows automatically on things when you drop them in. Yeah, that's really cool. And that's helpful, right? For those of us who you know care about the three dimensionality of you know of the maps that we're making, um, being able to add a drop shadow when you didn't necessarily and shouldn't have intended to put one in the original art because I might use it in other capacities. But you know, this is um, this is a really quick map that you know anybody could um could be pretty excited about right yeah and that was my aim with uh, particularly the into the world's pieces was to be able to just um kind of throw something together this modular hill set was very much inspired by how i used to play uh tabletop games myself we had a bunch of these bits of polystyrene cut up with some grass mat on top that we'd arrange in different ways to make stackable hills so I figured that would be a, a useful thing for the, the digital tabletop as well. You know, and it's funny you say that. Um, and, and you mentioned um, uh, Critical Role. It's, it's funny how that, that activated me as well. I, I, I played uh, Dungeons and Dragons as a kid and I just loved the platform for storytelling. And, and then I, I got back into it with my, my sons because I wanted something that, you know, we weren't, you know, they weren't playing video games. We were interacting yeah. and we were sort of developing ourselves. And, um, and so we, uh, you know, I, I picked up the game and that's how I got into it is I, I wanted to make really interesting and fun things for my boys to, you know, really be interested in, in, uh, you know, the, the maps that we were playing and things like that. And so, um, yeah, so that's how I got into it as well. And I really just liked the, the, the storytelling part of, of Critical Role and it sort of you know activated my imagination and, yeah, and got into definitely. it. I, I put in this little tile here because um, these are some assets that I made just for people who want to uh, leverage some of the automation inside of um, Foundry. I can turn this into a teleporter that once you walk into it, you enter the cave and you go into a, a whole other um, map right which i can link to another tom cartos yep. cave map because i think you've got a bunch of those so you yep. know all of a sudden I've, I've i've constructed in just a couple of minutes you know a, a, a pretty usable um and tactically interesting adventure so anyway so i wanted to show them that i wanted to jump into some other stuff here and ask you some more questions as we go um you have uh some really really cool maps you have an entire town Thank called you. driftwood right yes yeah, and we're looking at just a, like a portion of that, right? We're looking at the Driftwood Church. Yeah. Um, and, uh, this this set, I designed them so all of the buildings uh, tile together, so you can lay them out as one entire long street, kind of design um, based on the design of old Wild West towns. That's great. I'm gonna I'm gonna turn on my player's uh, view here, so we can see further. And this is, I mean, this is a beautiful map and you can see you've got the roofs module uh, or the, the the native roof stuff inside of Foundry working, right? So I can walk under the yeah. roof and I can go into yeah, the building. Yeah, we set up a canopies. Yeah, it's fantastic. And what I thought, because this town isn't just a single 
level, although in this particular map it is because that's a you know that's a, a limitation of foundry and frankly most VTTs is yeah you know you can only do so much at one level right but you can see there's a staircase that goes up to something um, but uh, but you would have to you know in historically create a, a second version of this that is the you know, show the second floor of some of these buildings and um, and so what I did was uh, I created a different version. And this version uses, and this is something that any GM watching this can do using your assets. I'll, I'll show them briefly how to do it. But this is a version that has everything in one map. So, you know, for example, um, I noticed, I was like, how do you get up to the up, upper floor? And then there's, you put this ladder here. And so I have this yeah. thing that automatically pops me up to the second floor where something that doesn't feel like church is going on up here. And I don't know what you're talking about. This is what <laughs> church looks like to me. <laughs> That's interesting churches you got it. Um, <laughs> but look, I'm looking down into the bottom level uh, because you've you've created the tile of the upper floor, yeah. right? And now I can walk over to the uh, uh, this this is a little bit wonky. I'll explain why why this works. I had to sort of hack your tiles a little bit to work with this. Um, but now I'm you know I'm in the the uh, uh, what do we call this the orphanage? Yes. And now I'm upstairs. Orphanage. And there's lighting and walls in a completely different configuration. But now I'm upstairs in the orphanage navigating around that. And, and why this is, is interesting is because when players are playing a map like this, there, there's two things that could happen, right? You could have the desire to explore and they'll do that. They'll right, you let them, they'll run yes, around and go, what's this room and what, what's, what's happening over here? And then, uh, and, and they'll inevitably come to that staircase and go, oh, where does this go, right? And, and there's a there's the inevitably the the chance to break sort of immersion right because then you've got to like say okay now hold on guys i'm going to take you up to the second floor and that sort of thing whereas yeah. you know using some of this new technology you can merge them together and you can make that more of a seamless experience now the more practical thing about you know creating you know, uh, you know multiple levels on one thing like i'm standing up here and i can go underneath is uh, when you have battle Right. So if I have a epic um, encounter happening and I've got, I now have enemies on the roof, I can have them on the floor, I, I can have them within the buildings on different levels. I can have that battle as tactically interesting as it is, I can, I can maintain that battle across, um, uh, you know, without breaking my, my uh, combat. And so it takes an entire map and it suddenly uh, looks at it in three dimensions and says, um, you know, hey, now I can, I can, I can battle in three dimensions. And and when I, when you think about critical role and what Matt Mercer does, he sets those up, right? He sets up, and this is another module just to show you the depth of how crazy oh, stuff wow. gets. But this shows, this is your, <laughs> this is your scene in three dimensions, right? I can now evaluate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, here's here's the upper floor of the orphanage. Here's you know, and and it's just. And when you think of like what Matt sets up when he's doing his sessions is in the players, you know, look across this three-dimensional battle map and their eyes go big and they're like, oh man, what could I do here? How could I tactically? And you do really interesting tactical things with your maps. And so, you know, I just thought it'd be interesting to take one of yours and show, you know, what it looks like um, when you start applying some of this stuff. It's it's fairly easy to do for people. If I go into my, my tile That's picker. Right yeah, and I jump. I know. I get asked a lot about how best to use the maps and make use of the fact that most of them are multi-level um, and include that in kind of a tactical encounter. And having these options in Foundry is just so powerful. Yeah, like here, here's a you know an example of that tile that I used. I think 140 DPI's. Yeah, that's the right one. Yeah, that's correct. And so you know, I just dragged in your tile, and then. It, this is, I, I won't go through how to, how to set up a levels enabled um, thing here. I have other tutorials on that. So if anybody's curious, just go to my, my YouTube channel and look up a uh, levels module. There's a handful of tutorials on how to do it, but eventually you end up, you know, using this UI and you set up your levels and then you put your tiles and your walls and your lights and everything on the levels that you want. So there's a little bit of setup, but it's totally worth it. If you, I mean, this kind of map is so immersive and, and there's so much you can do in it that this would be something that, that I would totally set up um, if I was uh, prepping for a game. So, so let me ask you, um, how, do you how do you approach 
your, your map making, like your stuff's really popular for good reason. How do you approach you know, your, your maps and your assets? Like, what are you thinking about as you're thinking about what to build and what to build next? Um, it kind of changes from map to map, uh, but a lot of it does come from my architectural background. My design process is quite similar to what I learned doing that. Um, in terms of what kind of map I'm going to make, I, I run polls on my Patreon. So actually that's largely down to just asking people what they want. But I also mm. like to do these theme sets. So you're talking about uh, Driftwood, my frontier town set. I also have Austin World, my starter town set. I have Doran, which is my big city set. And I'm currently starting to work on a desert city set. So I like to theme each of my map series around a particular location, which I then tie in with a city map or town map or region map. Um, and then a lot of it comes from research. I spend almost as much time kind of looking up research and referencing and uh, reading about things, watching videos as I do making the maps themselves. Then when it comes to the individual battle map, uh, it's, like I said, it's uh, kind of the architectural process in my mind. So I'm thinking, what spaces does this particular building need? and starting to lay them out. But then as I'm refining it, what I normally have in my head is I'm starting to build a story, like who lives here, who uses the space, how do they use it? What particular quirks of their character would change how it might look to something more generic? And that's a lot of the time as I'm getting more and more into my maps, I'm, I'm thinking more and more about the character of the place and the character of the people who inhabit it. So I include like a little kind of, uh, inspiration text with a lot of my maps kind of a use it if you like the dms with the, the law that i had in my head at the time and some people choose to use that and it's, it's really cool to see that they kind of take what nonsense comes out of my mind and run with it and expand on it and build whole worlds out of it and that you, you said that build whole worlds you, your your body of work really is at the at the world building level right i mean you you know don't like don't only just provide these ready-made adventures, which we'll talk about here. We're gonna talk about the Hobgoblin Blockade, um, where you've got all the storytelling layers built in and you've got you've got characters and you've got items uh, built yes. in and it's all just kind of out of the box. You've got all the tokens that that I need. You've got, um, but then you you also provide the, the elements, like this roof is probably a, yeah. a tile somewhere that, that I can go then and, and put into a, yeah, there a different is. map. I mean. While we're talking about this, I do have to shout out. I work with some other very talented people who help me with this. So I work with um, Alex from Tavern Tales, who helps me write the adventures. He does a lot of the writing. And uh, Daryl of Splattered Ink Games, he makes the tokens. Uh, so I'm, I'm very lucky that I work with a very talented group of people who help me bring all this together. And um, Dagonzo, Dagonzo Adventures, he helps me set up all my foundry stuff. Mulk, who does all my dungeon draft packs. So... Yeah, I've been really lucky to meet a lot of other talented creators in the field and get to work with them. And that is something that you do that I think is unique is the amount of collaboration that you yeah. uh, that you do. You you seem to sort of be a yes to any, anyone who's got an idea <laughs> or I mean, even even with me, I've come to you and said, hey, you should you should think about this. And you're like, yeah, let's do that. And so I just I, I, yeah, I love absolutely. how sort of open you are with with what you do. I mean, the the whole hobby is about you know playing with other people it's it's not supposed to be something you do on your own and I am self-employed I do work from home and it's it's always fun to to work with someone else to collaborate to see how other people's methods might influence my own and vice versa so yeah I'm, I'm always down to collab as long as I've got time which isn't always the easiest thing when you're running a business and raising a newborn baby yeah, no, I've got I've got four. They're not babies. Yeah, anymore, yeah, you're well ahead of me on that. It's uh, you know, they, they practically uh, take care of themselves these days, so it's fine. Um, <laughs> That's nice to hear. But but yeah, so you know, we're looking at this. I, I wanted to just zoom in on this because is this is the Hobgoblin Blockade your first sort of full um kind of packaged adventure or like what? Because this is this is a module that I downloaded um from your yes. Patreon and and I just installed it straight into. Uh, into Foundry and all of a sudden it just so, popped out with all the stuff. So what is yep. this? So we've been creating adventures, myself and Alex, for more than a year now. And I've been creating Foundry content since, uh, almost since I started, since the Foundry beta. Uh, but this is the first time we've kind of packaged everything together and I felt ready that we had the tokens, we had the writing, uh, we had the maps, we had everything set up. And um, I've been working with... Um, 
uh, Dragon's Horn Studios and Kelsil's Tales, and they helped me put together this whole package. So Rug Holter Dragon's Horn Studios has made this brilliant uh, adventure module importer, which allows you to package everything up and then allows DMs to just import it all into their world with a single click, just brings everything in exactly as you need it, your journal entries, your items, NPCs, stat blocks, maps, scenes, everything. Um, so this is this was almost kind of a test run to see how the, the pipeline worked and how quickly we could get this stuff out. And uh, we're gonna be putting out at least one of these a month going forwards. I mean, but, I, um, Halloween as I was coming out later this month. Oh, that's great. I mean, as I was prepping for this and I was just running around this map, I'm like, there's so much good stuff in here. The storytelling yeah. is is the thing that jumps out, right? It's all of the, uh, the. I mean, just looking at like the tactical stuff is like super interesting, you know, but but you've you've tagged stories to all the areas of the map that, that I care yeah. about. And they're all like well done and interesting, right? And so as I was running through it, I was like, oh, this would be cool if, um, and just kind of knowing what Foundry can do, uh, you know, one of the things was that this would be cool if, if these trap doors actually really worked, right? If I could actually um, yeah. take a player from one of the, and you you saw me jumping around because I'm the GM, it's not automated for me, but to my player, they just automatically go to the next screen, right? It's yeah, seamless for them. And so I thought <clears throat> people might be curious how I did this. And and I've got these little tiles in my module. Like if you, uh, I think I showed you earlier, if you search for active tiles and mm -hmm. um, when I click on it, and this is using a module called monks active tiles. And what it does is it adds this little tab here for triggers and, and you can make it super flexible. Like, you know, who could trigger this and, and what, ha like, when would it get triggered? And maybe I only want it to happen once per, per player, that sort of thing. I've got a tutorial coming out on this, so I won't go into too much detail, but then I can add these triggers. And this one says, Hey, I want to teleport. And you pick this little thing and, and, and you can even go to a different scene and say, I want to teleport to this exact spot on this scene. And uh, you know, cool. I can select this other stuff, and all of a sudden, and of course, this tile is invisible to users, right? It's it's hidden from them. It's just for me, the GM, to know that there's something active there. And I can even I can even if I want to deactivate it temporarily. Maybe I don't want them to go down to that level because we're in combat and something like that. Um, but it's a way of just automating a player's you know uh, maneuvering around a, a map this big with this much ability to discover. And so uh, that that would be cool. There's some areas also where there's some real uh, significant plot events to happen that maybe I don't want air, uh, users to enter if they're just you know navigating around. And I can take a, a similar tile and I can pause their movement. I can pause the entire game so that all all gameplay stops if they sort of enter this like important area, right? Um, and then you know there's some other things that I think are super helpful for players like these uh what are they magma methods that yeah. you know there's a there's a plot hook around here um that i think you discover some information from them type of thing and uh i think they're afraid of the frost brand sword if i'm not mistaken yeah that's correct well this is cool i didn't notice this little effect here but maybe i don't want them to be uh here necessarily at first maybe i want to sort of introduce them later so if i uh use the um Quick Encounters um, module, I can save these methods to a journal entry and it hides them. And I can put that journal entry now anywhere I want, like right here, for example, it's only, only I can see it as the GM. Um, but when I'm ready to show them to the players, I can just run it. This will actually add it to combat, which that maybe I don't cool. want to do that. But all of a sudden, they're here exactly where they were saved. And I can even save them in three-dimensional space. I can have them hovering 50 feet up or, or whatever I want. And so as I was thinking about this really epic battle, so I love this. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but in the plot, if someone gets up to this signal fire and lights it, then it uh, it catalyzes the this the sort of reinforcements. Is that yes. I understand? Yeah, that right? that's exactly right. Yeah. And uh, so I love this and I, I like the idea of just having them materialize out of nowhere. Now you have them hidden perfectly acceptable and easy way to do that. But what if, what if I wanted to have some of the enemies sort of already on the ramparts and sort of already uh, in tactically difficult or compromising positions for me. Right. And, uh, and so that's another use of um, the, uh, the quick encounters module is uh, being able to, to add all of these guys. Let me see if I can do them all together here. Uh, you know, 
it's my it's my wall is getting in my way unfortunately but it, oh here we go now i've got them all selected so i could add these guys all to a quick encounter save it and then you know it puts them all here and then i just click on it and Open. they all deploy and i can yeah. even have multiple waves like let's say this is i wave number one i define in certain areas wave number two and then i can have multiple entries where i just i progressively you know depending on how my party's doing right maybe they took care of that first wave a little too easy maybe i want to you know double or triple up on them kind of thing so uh it just helps for gms to kind of know what's available so that they can build these kind of flexible encounters and really leverage the space and the tactical elements that you've that you've put up here um so anyway great map great map love it can't wait Thank to you. use it um well so what's next for you what what can we expect um from tom cartos here in the foreseeable future so I'm going to be continuing my Patreon as normal. We put out maps, assets, tokens, adventures, foundry stuff every month, every week, sometimes every day. And that's not going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, the next big thing that I'm currently working on, in fact, I've literally just stopped doing it to come and talk to you, is I am recording a tutorial series that will go on YouTube probably towards the end of this month or beginning of next month. That's going to take people through my entire process for wow. drawing battle maps. So you asked me earlier kind of what my thought process is. It'll go through that and also the actual kind of technical stuff inside Photoshop. So similar to what you do in Foundry and Dungeon Draft, I'm just going to walk people through my workflow. I love so it. I think I've, I've found ways in Photoshop to kind of shortcut and mimic certain things that you know, if you're not a trained artist would be quite daunting to do, but there's a lot of really cool ways that you can kind of hack it and um, make something that looks well, like one of my battle maps. That is amazing. I can't wait to see that. And even though I do so much of my work in dungeon draft, the, the getting insight into how an artist approaches uh, his or her work is really the main value of of these yeah. things and to see it happen within the tool that you're using if someone wants to pick up photoshop it can be uh, it can be a little bit uh, daunting right there's a lot of buttons Absolutely. and a lot of windows yeah, and but but to watch your workflow and to hear you you know um you know sort of talk talk through what you're doing as you're doing it and why you're doing it's probably the most important thing is yeah. just it's gold for for those of us who who have some uh, design ability but maybe um you know, don't, don't really have the mechanics yet. I just love it. I can't wait to see it and um, cool. definitely <laughs> expect to learn a lot from it. Oh, thanks very much. Well, Tom, this was great. Thanks for making the time today. I know you're on the other side of the pond and we're uh, about eight hours apart, but, um, but this was, this was a really good session. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, if you guys want to see more of Tom's stuff, I uh, will link to his YouTube channel and to his Patreon from the, uh, from the, the video description. And, uh, and yeah, pick up Molinet, um, check out some of the other modules that I was using. If you guys have questions, ask me in the comments and I'll tell you specifically what modules I was using or how I was using them. And, uh, and otherwise, uh, thanks again, Tom, for, for making the time and, uh, and I hope everybody has fun making their maps. Thanks so much for having me.